Sup y'all, and welcome to the Geography of Industry and Services, Part 3. In this video, we're going to continue looking at changes in industrial production by asking this essential question. What role does cost play in the location of industries and services? With any model, the real world is simplified in order to focus on the most influential variables. And with economic models, certain assumptions must be made. Now, three consistent assumptions are that people will maximize their advantages over their competition. If you have an iPhone, then you definitely know what Siri is. That technology was purchased by the Apple Corporation back in 2011 for around $200 million. By placing this voice recognition technology on their phones, they became desirable, making billions for Apple Incorporated while reducing their competition. And this is an example of horizontal integration. A second assumption is that people or firms will want to increase their profits as much as possible. While this may seem obvious, some are certainly more successful at this than others. Finally, we need to assume that people will work to minimize variable costs, things such as energy, transportation, labor, tax rates. This is a major reason why a lot of your reading is done in a more digital fashion. Ebooks are more popular now than ever. And have you ever heard of the cloud? Cloud computing is where the software is maintained on networks on a remote server, rather than having it on your actual computer. Many corporations switch to this because of the money they can save utilizing this approach. So with these assumptions in mind, let's investigate the least cost theory created in 1909 by Alfred Weber, who was a German economist, and it's for this reason we pronounce it Weber. He devised his model of industrial location, emphasizing that firms consider three essential costs. The primary cost they sought to minimize was transportation. According to Weber, this was the most important factor since at that time it was the most expensive. A second consideration was to reduce the cost of labor. And a third consideration was to maximize agglomeration economies. By clustering people and businesses near each other, an environment of cumulative causation is established, in which more investment attracts more business, etc., etc. According to Weber, once you take into consideration the location of raw materials, the location of the closest market, and the different transportation costs, a specific point would indicate the lowest cost of production, and would therefore be the ideal location for the factory. So, how can you determine this ideal location? Weber narrowed this model down to two separate cases, the weight losing case and the weight gaining case. Just think when you go to the post office to mail a package. One of the first things they do is to measure it and weigh it. Obviously, a durable and relatively lightweight good, such as a golf ball, would be far less expensive to transport than something heavy or bulky, such as barbells. However, even if something is light, it still may be expensive to transport, such as a light bulb. Nonetheless, Weber's least cost theory only focuses on the weight or the size of a good, not the fragility. So let's first look at the weight losing case or the bulk reducing case. So here's a graph representing the transportation of a raw material from a source. Let's say you're transporting wood to make wooden furniture. Bringing trees to your plant would be expensive, as you can see the gradient of it going up in this direction. But after you process it, you can see that the weight would certainly go down, and that's why the gradient goes down at a lower rate. So ideally, you wanna start moving it closer to the source. As you can see, if you move your processing location closer to the source, the cost goes down. Ultimately, ideally, you would locate your processing plant directly at the source, reducing your cost as much as possible. Now this makes sense if you are making, let's say, paper, or you're talking about wooden furniture, like I just said, or even if you're talking about smelting or making of steel, because you would start with a great deal of ore and a lot of impurities, and you need to burn them off. So these kinds of activities are located close to the source where the raw materials come from. And next, is the weight gaining case, or we call it the bulk gaining case. So according to this graph, in this instance, when you're bringing whatever it is from the source, after you process your good, the weight or the bulk of it will increase. And so will the transportation cost, as you can see. This sort of thing could happen if you're adding, let's say, water to whatever you're making. So in the next graph, you see if you're moving your processing location closer to the market instead of the source, the cost of transportation goes down. And so ultimately, ideally, you want to bring your processing location closest to the market as possible in the weight gaining case. The weight gaining case works well if you're talking about bottling of certain things, if you're adding water, 
to soft drinks or to beer or something along those lines, or also making bread products. It's a lot cheaper to bring flour than it is to bring the actual bread itself. Now, there are legitimate criticisms to Alfred Weber's least cost theory. For example, transportation costs are not necessarily directly proportional to distance, as different modes of transportation cost differently per mile. The most efficient and cheapest way to transport most goods today, within relatively shorter distances of a few hundred miles, is by truck. In the US and other MDCs, this has been bolstered by modern highways and infrastructure systems. Now, rail is still the best way to transport goods of medium range distances of hundreds to a couple thousand miles over land, especially if the good is extremely heavy, such as stone, salt, or coal. But the cheapest way to transport goods, especially over far distances, is by ship. Around 90% of all trade is done worldwide through ocean transportation, and containerization has made this possible. And this was not utilized back in Weber's day, since containerization wasn't invented until the 1950s and was minimally utilized until the 1970s. Along with modern modes of transportation, there are intermodal connections, such as break of bulk locations, where goods are moved from one mode of transportation to another mode of transportation. And this is where the real benefits of containerization materialized. In this image, you see goods being moved from ship to truck. Of course, goods can also be moved from ship to rail, or rail to truck, and so on. Of course, if you want to move goods rapidly between two locations, you can often ship them by air. However, it is a matter of physics. If you have a ship on water, you have neutral buoyancy. So therefore, it takes a lot less energy to transport something on the water. Whereas, trying to get a plane off the ground with a full cargo is the most expensive way to transport something. Regardless, it still has its purpose. Along with the criticism of variable transport cost, today, transportation only counts between 5 and 15% of total cost for most firms, depending on what the good is. Remember, Weber contended that transportation cost was the most important to reduce. But bear in mind, his theory was formed in 1909, and we can credit a great deal of this reduction in transportation cost to improvements in transport technology, such as containerization. And costs are not equal for given weights of materials. A glass may weigh the same as a wood cup, but the glass is obviously more fragile and therefore more expensive to transport. Now this map of the United States shows a bunch of resources that would be needed for steel production back in Weber's time. The different letters represent different possible locations. Now back in Weber's day, if you were going to make steel, you would need iron ore of whatever type. You'd also need a heating source in order to melt it. So whether you're talking about coal or wood, those other resources, you would need to be near a steel plant. What I'd like you to do is to guess on your own which letter you think would be the most ideal location for putting a steel plant. So what do you come up with? Well, if you came up with G as your answer, it's a pretty good guess. However, U would be the best in this instance because of the ideal location of iron ore, coal, and the woods. But what about market location? See, down in U, you don't have a major access to enormous cities and a lot of the population that you have in the Northeast or in the Midwest. So in reality, G could, in real terms, be the better choice. And what about variations in cost over time? The Weber model doesn't look at this. For example, you might have the value of ore or coal go up or down, transportation cost could go up or down. So certain costs may not be the same from one year to the next or from one month to the next. And another key concept to realize is the substitution principle. So let's suggest that you do have an increase in labor cost. Well, then logically you're saying you would move to someplace cheaper. So let's say you had an increase in union labor cost up in the Midwest. Well, then logically you'd say for sure you want to go back down to you. However, if a government official allows for the tax rates to go down, then you could substitute an increase in cost with a reduction in your tax cost. So therefore, you would stay put. While many modern economists and geographers contend that Weber focused too much on costs and not enough on profit or revenues, his theory of industrial location maintains its position as a pivotal study 
and his conclusions are still quite valid in our current globalized world. That is correct.